Christmas. Halloween. Oh. <laughs> no, no, I'm, yeah, you gotta go through the, you gotta go through the stains. Say good morning. Halloween, and then. Uh, ready for a long one today? It'll be Christmas. Yeah, it's about the time. I went to, yeah. I meant to, uh, um, Michael's, Michael's, whatever, the other day, and that, it was solid Christmas, the whole store. I was like, no. Payday at the end of the week, huh? I'm ready. I'm ready. Supposed to wear a uh, color color yeah. shirt today. For what? For pictures at the office. You're going to be in big trouble. Really? You know how to do that. No, but I just stood next to it. You know, I think I want to take. Well, I think you get. A, I think you get a special compensation. <coughs> I, my guess. Back, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm ready. They have a grocery store format for Jenny and my state. They tell me, and I think a lot of them should be doing Do. You have a grocery store? Yeah. He yeah. might have one. I won't be here the second yeah. meeting in October. I also picked up um, vacation at the Meek family, 40 acres in Castaic. Good morning. Oh. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Wednesday, September 27th, in case, in case you're at the wrong meeting, uh, Tulare P Planning Commission and Tulare County Planning Commission. <coughs> so we'll start by uh, a roll call, please. Song? Here. Billy? Here. Elliot? Commissioner Elliot is absent. He did advise us he would be absent. Diaz? Here. Whitlatch? Here. Pigliano? Here. Aguilar? Here. This time we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. Kneeling down. I know. I like that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No kneeling down either. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't. But we could join hands. <laughs> but I don't need to uh, yeah. watch that game either. Anyway. No, I'm on, I'm boycotting them. Okay. Let's continue with this part. Then. A little political dialogue. <laughs> At this time, members of the public, <coughs> excuse me, may comment on any item not appearing on the agenda. Under state law, matters presented under this item cannot be discussed or acted upon by the Planning Commission at this time. For items appearing on the agenda, the public will be invited to make comments at the time the item comes up for Planning Commission consideration. So that all interested parties have an opportunity to speak, any member addressing the Planning Commission may be limited at the discretion of the Chair. Note, in order to be considered by the Planning Commission, testimony on public hearings items must be given at the time scheduled for public hearing. At all times, please use the microphone and state your name and address for the record. Is there anyone wishing to make any public comment this, at this time? Seeing none, we will continue. Item number three is the approval of the September 13th, 2017 minutes. I make a motion we approve the minutes of September 13th, 2017 as presented. Second, yes. Roll call, please. Long? Yes. Bailey? Abstain. Yes? Yes. Whitlatch? Abstain. Pitigliano? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. <laughs> okay, this time we're going to um, 
Item number four is a continued public hearing for final site plan PSR 17-004, and I will be recusing myself from this one, so somebody's gonna take over. Who's the vice chair? I am. <laughs> oh, you are? Yes. Oh, John is, that's right, John. <laughs> I can say so it'll be the past, past chair. That'll be it. Yeah? That's a good idea. Oh, past chair. no, it's Wayne do it, taking Sorry, it. Just, you want to do that too? Doesn't yeah, make any Wayne difference. Wayne take it. All right, Wayne. You're the tallest one. Only, only in my mind. <laughs> like the lo longest stick. Very strong. <clears throat> Good morning, Dana. Good morning, Commissioner Millies. I will um, introduce, uh, we're into public hearings. This is public hearing uh, 4A, final site plan number PSR 17-004, Maximus 3 Company, categorical exemption and final plan, uh, site plan uh, PSR 17-004 to approve provide entitlement for a 12,000 square foot grocery store on a 32,000 square foot parcel in the PDC2 plan development general commercial zone. The site is located on the north side of Avenue 56, approximately 300 feet west of Early Mart Avenue. Uh, that is the White River Plaza uh, retail center uh, in the community of Early Mart. Continued from J July 26th, 2017. And our contact this morning is Dana Metlin. Thank you. Good morning. <coughs> uh, as mentioned, this item was continued from July 26th because the applicant had not yet received the will serve letter from the Early Mart Public Utility District. And that district did meet on August 21, 2017, and they did approve a variance for the project. The project is categorically exempt from CEQA. According to section 15303, class three pertaining to new construction. And this project is compatible with this exemption because the commercial <coughs> building is located in an urbanized area on property zoned for such use. Entitlement is found in section 12 regarding the C2 zone and also in section 18.6 regarding the PD overlay zone which requires a planned development application and approval by the Planning Commission. This is the property ownership map. This project was noticed according to the law and staff has not received any inquiries about this project. The project was found to be consistent with these uh, general plan policies and it is in the urban <coughs> development boundary for the community of Early Mart. And the Land use designation is general commercial. The vicinity map. The project is located in the northwest corner of Avenue 56 and Early Mart Avenue, approximately 500 feet east of SR 99 and the 56 on-ramp in Early Mart. Caltrans submitted comments regarding the project and its impact on SR 99 Avenue 56 on-ramp. A traffic impact study was performed for the whole White River Plaza development in 2014, indicating that the project at full build out would not negatively impact the flow of traffic and that the existing road network is adequate to accommodate the, the uh, development. No mitigation was re recommended. This is the zoning <coughs> map. The project is in the PDC2, which is planned development general commercial and directly north is a residential subdivision in the R1 zone and a solid block wall will be constructed with this development to separate the residential and the commercial uses. The aerial photograph of the project site. And this is a closer view, more recent construction of the McDonald's over here and this project will go in this area right here. This is the site plan. The market will be open seven days a week. The hours will be 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. and fully staffed. <coughs> the store will have 20 to 25 full-time employees.
the elevation and another elevation from a different perspective. <coughs> this is the floor plan that was submitted and this market will provide full services in produce, meat, deli, bakery, grocery, international foods and pharmacy. And this is staff's recommendation that your commission approve a categorical exemption and conditionally approve <coughs> final site plan number PSR 17-004. Slash PD. Question. And that concludes staff's report. Sure. You know, I, I was looking here and uh, I didn't see the how do the road access how do we access this site? I believe there are two accesses. Looking There's yeah, there one go. here. Okay. Oh, so they're going to go. So it's all internal roadways. So they're going to go past. Past all the other, yes. I see. Okay, that that explains it. I was just looking, and uh, from where the site is, I I didn't see any roads uh, uh, designation. Yeah, there's so. internal easements between these parcels in here. Okay. And the market will go right. So it just being area. like an internal shopping center kind yes. of a thing. Yes. Okay. Right. <coughs> any other questions? Uh, at this time. Um, I will open uh, the public hearing on this project uh, for commentary um, from either uh, proponents or opponents. Uh, if the uh, project originator would like to come up and speak on this project, uh, you're welcome to do so now. Good. Good morning, um, Commissioner. Uh, Melody's uh, members of the uh, Tulare County uh, Planning Commission staff and audience. My name is uh, Max Becerra, principal of Maximus 3 Company and also uh, an owner of uh, White River Plaza LLC. Um, and your address? We, your address? And my uh, address is 900 Mohawk Street Suite, uh, 245 Bakersfield, 93309. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, we are very excited uh, uh, about this uh, uh, project. Um, White River Plaza is a 7.1-acre uh, commercial uh, center that we had uh, envisioned and, and uh, wanted to, to bring uh, to um, Early Mart. And um, we, are, we are very pleased that we have very strong uh, national tenant uh, pads out in front. AutoZone, uh, Dollar General, and McDonald's, but we also need an anchor for the center. And um, having um, a grocery store, full service grocery store, that was our goal, and we were able to achieve that to serve the uh, residents of, of, uh, of Early Mart. So, uh, so we look forward to, to moving forward uh, with, with this uh, project, and we'd like to thank the uh, uh, planning staff, um, and the good work of Dana to make sure we uh, um, structure uh, this, this project uh, uh, correctly. Our goal is to be able to um, uh, to move forward uh, with plans if, if your um, commission approves this project and then be able to be up by uh, mid-2018 uh, um, with, the, with the doors uh, opening. Um, I also wanted to uh, thank uh, the Apostolic Church there in, in Early Mart uh, for parting with some of their land uh, uh, so that we could build that east part of, of this entire project and uh, so that White River Plaza can now have this grocery store and the auto zone and the uh, uh, McDonald's. So that, that was very helpful. So it's a, a community effort, so we thank everybody. And uh, that, that's all my comments. We have no problems with any of the, the conditions on here. Thank you. Yes. Uh, it's probably in here. I've missed it. Is this a, a chain? Is this a locally owned store? So are there other stores like it? Yes. Oh, uh -huh. there are. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's part of the uh, Fiesta Foods um, chain that you see up and down uh, uh, the valley. Oh, okay. They're associated okay. with them. Thank so you. So there are us, uh, probably in other small communities? Uh, in communities uh, from as far north of, uh, as uh, 
past Fresno to, to all the way down to uh, uh, the Bakersfield, Lamont area. Okay, thank you. So we want to make sure we had somebody strong and established. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you very sir. much. Good morning, board. My name is Abigail Solis, and I am a resident of the community of Early Mart, 753 East Quail Avenue in Early Mart. And I just wanted to uh, speak in favor of the, of the project. As a, a lifelong resident of that community, I know that the, a grocery <coughs> store is a great need for that community and many small communities like it throughout Tulare <coughs> County. The current situation in Early Mart is that most residents have to travel either 20 miles uh, north to Tulare or you know, 10 miles south to Delano to buy groceries because the stores that we have in town right now are small kind of corner store markets that are overpriced and most people do not buy the bulk of their groceries there. So this store would provide an opportunity for our residents to purchase their groceries in town and, and of course spend their money in early Mart. So um, I look forward to moving forward with this project and I would just want to express my support for this project. Thank you. Thank you. But this will also draw other stores to the uh, center. Uh, that, that's a good magnet for other retail businesses. Are there any other comments from the public? If not, I'll close the public hearing at this time, and uh, we will look at the uh, recommendations from staff. Dana, would you like to go through those briefly? Uh, I, staff is recommending that your commission approve a categorical exemption from the California Environmental Quality Act and the state's CEQA guidelines for the implementation of the California Environmental Quality Act of 1970 as amended pursuant to section 15303 class three pertaining to new construction or conversion of small structures and conditionally approve final site plan number PSR 17-004 slash PD. Thank you, do I have a motion from a commissioner? Yes, I would like to make a motion that we approve the categorical <coughs> exemption from the California Environmental Quality <laughs> Act CEQA and the state CEQA guidelines for the implementation of the California Environmental Quality Act of 1970 as amended pursuant to section 15303 class three pertaining to new construction or conversion of small structures and conditionally approve final site plan PSR 17-004. Do a second? I'll second motion. So moved. Gong? Yes. Haley? Yes. 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 Whitlatch? Yes. Patigliano? Yes. <coughs> That's a good project for them. Velma? So moved. Velma. Password doesn't work, Velma. Nice. Always prepared, huh? If you don't like that, there's more. <coughs> Does it make any difference on my computer? <coughs> it only shows TC visitor. It doesn't show a one or two. Does that make a difference? Okay. So just go to TC visitor. Yes, guess plus ITS. one. Okay, I got it. I'll try it. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. Oh, I'll welcome myself back. <coughs> At this time, we're going to continue with item number five parcel map uh, public hearings. Action on parcel maps in this section of the agenda will be heard in one public hearing unless anyone wishing to discuss any one of the items requests that it be pulled for separate public hearing. No staff rep, uh, presentation will be given at any time in, on any item unless requested. In any case, there will be a separate vote on these items. So we have uh, ten tentative parcel map number PPM 17034, Constance Rowe and Dave Donald Keller Halls, West Coast Land Surveying, model R. Wyatt. Wyant. Item B, tentative parcel map number PPM 17-027. Michael and Penny Wells, Neil Zerlang Lang's uh, land surveyor. 
Anyone wish to have e either of these two pulled? Then we will continue. Uh, we will open the public hearing. Seeing none, then we will close the public hearing and we will continue with uh, a vote on each item. I'll make a motion that we approve categorical exemption consistent with the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, and the state CEQA guidelines pursuant to Title 14, California Code Regulations, Section 15303, Class 3, pertaining to the construction and location of limited number of new small facilities or structures and conditionally approved tentative <coughs> parcel map number PPM 17-034, and waiver of final final map. I second that motion. Gong? Yes. Millies? Yes. 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 Petigliano? Yes. Agnes. Yes. Item B. I'll make a motion we approve the category exemption consistent with the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, and the state CEQA guidelines pursuant to Title 14 California Code Regulation, Section 15303, Class 3, pertaining to the <coughs> construction and conversion of small structure and approved tentative partial map number PPM 17-027 slash PSR with a final map waiver. Second. I'll, I'll second. And the vote. Gong? Yes. Millie? Yes. Diaz? Yes. Willack? Yes. Tigliano? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. All right, we will continue with item number six, a public hearing for final site plan number PSR 17-005. And we have Dana to present. Again, thank you. Uh, this project before you is to allow an accessory structure on a 10 acre parcel in the PDFM zone and this is in Springville. The project is categorically exempt from CEQA pursuant to section 15303 class 3 pertaining to new construction and the use of this section is applicable and appropriate because the addition of one 1600 square foot barn-like metal structure is accessory to the on-site dwelling. Entitlement is found in section 187B2D, whereby accessory buildings that are associated with residential uses shall require a final site plan review by the Planning Commission. Dana, a little confused. Can you explain again why it needs a site plan review by the Planning Commission? Well, this looks like it's yeah. most entitled. The <coughs> ordinance says that any accessory buildings in the PDFM zone, regardless of whether they're associated with a residential use or a commercial use, they still require the final site plan review process. And it, so it's the zoning thing. Is that is that what it is? I know. Because of the zone? Unfortunate. Correct. Okay. <coughs> this is the property ownership map and the project was noticed according to the law. Staff did receive one inquiry from an adjacent property owner and when informed that the project was only an accessory structure to the existing residence, the uh, property owner was satisfied. <coughs> And that individual lived right here on this parcel. <coughs> See the number, but that's where she called from. Project is consistent with these general plan policies. And this project is located within the Foothill Growth Management Plan, the Tule River Development Corridor, and the land use designation is Development Corridor. This is the vicinity map, and the project is located on the south side of Mountain Road 189, approximately three miles east of Springville. This is the zoning map. 
As mentioned, this site is PDFM, and it contains two residences and an orchard. All of the surrounding properties are also zoned PDFM and contain, contain rural residential uses. This is the aerial photograph. This is the site plan. And the project is a 1,600 square foot metal storage building for the storage of farm equipment so that they are not subjected <coughs> to the weather. And <coughs> there is not any direct sale of fruit from this location. The gentleman has apple orchards. And this is staff's recommendation that your commission approve a categorical <laughs> exemption and conditionally approve final site plan number PSR 17-005. And that concludes staff's report. <coughs> okay, at this time we will open the public hearing portion. Is there anyone who would like to speak on this item? <coughs> right. So we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Public comment and is hmm. we'll entertain a motion to accept. Before we vote, I'm just curious, was this one involved in that fire up there? Because this was right behind the city of Springville or town. Uh, th know. It wasn't, I wasn't, because so. I saw the whole backdrop behind the town was on fire. And this is three miles to the east, was it? That's interesting. Okay. You ready for okay. a motion? We're ready for a motion. Uh, we'll make a motion that we approve a categorical exemption consistent with CEQA and the uh, state sequel guidelines for <coughs> Title 14, California Code Regulations, Section 15303, Class 3, pertaining to new construction or conversion of s small structures, and to conditionally approve final site plan number PSR 17 005. <coughs> second? I'll second. second. Move on, Millie's. Second. Second, Millie's. And we'll go ahead and uh, have a vote. Zong? Yes. Millie's? Yes. <coughs> yes. Yes. Willach? Yes. Pigliano? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. The item B. Mr. Chairman, I will need to recuse myself from this item. Item B is a special use permit, number PSP 17-062. And we have April to, as the contact. Good morning, Chairman Aguilar and Commissioners. I'm April Hill, Planner 3 from RMA Planning. The use permit would allow a, uh, an agricultural service establishment for grading services requested by David Cardoza. <coughs> On a five-acre portion of a nine-and-a-half-acre parcel located in the A40 zone, the applicants have been working from the site since about 1992. Similar uses have existed there since the 1960s. It does come as a result of a, of a code compliance violation, and we went through project review committee. Sites on the north side of Avenue 184, about half-mile east of Road 80, three and a half miles west of the city of Tulare and <coughs> State Route 99. Uh, maximum daily trips will average about 25, a minimal portion of the traffic on road on Avenue 184. The um, project is located outside any urban development, urban area boundary and subject to the Rural Out Valley Lands Plan. It's in compliance with the zoning ordinance and the general plan elements. Property is located in the AE40 zone, as are the surroundings. It's classified as an ag service establishment rather than a contractor storage yard because it's more than five acres in size, although uh, but the owner does live on the site. <coughs> The project will not have an impact on biological resources of the area. Uh, the California Natural Diversity Database does show historic present pre 
presence of the Samokin kit box near the site, but the nine acre parcel has been used for agriculture for decades and has had uh, agricultural service establishments on there as well. No signs of special status species. The property contains no wetlands or waterways. The nearest canal is about 1,500 feet south. Elk Bayou is about half mile southeast. It is in a flood hazard zone A, which requires an elevation certificate and associated flood, flood hazard mitigation measures. Uh, regarding, oh, okay. In all directions are agriculture and scattered rural residences, and the nearest residence is about uh, 1,400 south feet southwest of the site. The noise is uh, generated by the um, by the project, by the grading business driving in, driving the equipment in and out will be similar to other ag operations in the area. Project qualifies for a categor for three categorical exemption sections. Uh, the general rule pertaining to a project that does not have the potential for causing a significant effect on the environment and therefore is not subject to CEQA. <coughs> um, the section 15301 about existing facilities and section 15303 regarding new construction or conversion of small structures. The applicant does have a building permit pending for a 7,000 square foot tractor shed. Uh, existing are an owner-occupied residence, shop buildings, some outbuildings, stormwater drainage pond, uh, a couple of fuel tanks. Conditions of approval are included in the resolution to address those. As I said before, the applicants acquired the property in about 1992 and similar uses have existed on the site since, the 19, uh, since about 1962. They currently employ nine workers. They use about six pickups and have nine tractors. Notice for the public hearing provided a 10-day comment <coughs> period. It was mailed to surrounding property owners within 300 feet. I've received no comments. Um, and this ends staff's report. Do you have any questions for me or? Mr. Cardoso is in the audience. Chairman, I have a question. Sure. No, I don't have a project, problem with the project. I'm just concerned on the uh, uh, interest of the why of the species concerned that the circle is not around the project. It's more to the south of the project. It's offset. Yeah, usually they have the right in the middle is where a sighting might have been, and then they do a radius around it. It's based on where they had a sighting, and then the circle just happens to touch a, this property, correct? Confirmed by uh, Chief Planner Hector Guerra. I got it. So, um, <coughs> well, this is, this is, is an existing operation that we're bringing into compliance, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> other than the, the pending permit for the structure, uh, is there any other changes? Uh, is the operation going to change uh, at all? No, I don't <coughs> believe so. You had any complaints uh, on this uh, path? That was the only one. <laughs> was when the building permit came in, we realized this is commercial use. This is not for personal use only. No problem. Thank you. All right. This time we will open the public hearing. If, if anybody wishes to make a comment, this is your chance. Seeing none, we will close the public hearing and we will entertain a motion. Yeah, one more quick question. You know, my, my past life continues to follow me, but I uh, worked for a company that manufactured PVC pipe for five years. And you have a detail called option two on here. And people are always secure or feel secure when they spec schedule 40 PVC pipe. Um, and we might want to look at that because that, that is not necessarily the best choice. Schedule 40 is built uh, on a different ratio. So say schedule 40, four, one inch has a much higher pressure rating than schedule, schedule 46 inch. And so uh, there is a much better way to do that instead of schedule 40, a more specific to water such as blue pipe that you see that's used for water systems 
and I haven't done this for a long time, but schedule 40 <coughs> is, a, is not a choice. This probably came from some plumbing book someplace, but uh, you probably have much less pressure protection on schedule 40 than you do um, using class 200, which is a 200 pressure rating. So, uh, as, and I'm still for the project, but you need to look at that spec. Mr. Engineer, thank you. With the chair, are you ref uh, referring to the fire um, requirements? As Tulare County Fire Prevention Bureau will show, gotcha. uh, talking about the pipe uh, to be used, gives you two options. And um, what is galvanized, what's polyurethane? But anyway, this is ancient stuff. You know, we we need to be in the we can Good bring century. that to the attention of the fire department. <coughs> they want to talk about it more, even though it was a long time ago. I mean, I have a why well, I have a general engineering contractor's license because we did all kinds of pipeline work, and I'm very familiar with PVC pipes and how it works. So. Okay, thank you. Now we'll entertain a motion. You have your glasses on, so go ahead. I make a motion that uh, we accept a categorical exemption <coughs> pursuant to uh, 14 California Code Regulations, sections 15061B3, and general rule section, section 15301, existing facilities, and section uh, 15303 to construction or conversion of small structures consistent with uh, with CEQA and state CEQA guidelines and conditionally approved special use permit PSP 17-02 subject to findings <coughs> and conditions. Second. I'll, I'll second it. And a vote. Long. Yes. Taylor? Yes. 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 She recused herself. Aguilar. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Velma, I still can't get online, and so I'm not sure for me to look at this next project. Uh, through the chair, if we could request a five minute break, we'll okay. prepare ourselves. Okay, can I have a five minute yeah. break so I can get online, please? Thank you. Brown recluse was up underneath there and it crawled out and bit her right behind the knee. Did she know right when it bit her? Uh, uh, yeah. And oh, fortunately, it? fortunately, her she she knew she had been bit, but she didn't know how bad. Fortunately, her 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 principal recognized it because a year before another teacher got bit and lost her thumb. Oh wow! And he says, "Get out of here right now. Go to the doctor." Yeah. And she rushed to the doctor. Within two hours, they were they were giving her the stuff. Taking it out. She went in. Twice a week for the first three weeks, and he would uh, numb it and get a, a tool like a melon balling tool and dig out all the dead flesh. Wow. What did she get bit by? Brown recluse spider. Oh, the recluse. Yeah, those are bad. Wow. And it was, an, it was nasty. And then it took her six months to get over that. How big an area is she? She's got a she's got a dent about this big around on the back of her knee, and the, and the got flesh damaged goods not as for deep a as wife. not as thick as not as thick as my thumb. Is her wife? Is it wife? It, it's not there. Dent, it's like dented can. Yeah. She's damaged. Uh, yeah. Reminder. Okay, <laughs> let's get started. Your wife? Mm -hmm. Your wife? Where where did she get bit? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. At, at her school? Oh, I thought she wasn't teaching anymore. Okay, at this time oh, we're gonna I, continue I with item C. Oh. Five years ago. And the Legacy Plans 2017 update. Uh, Chairman Aguilar, I am Aaron Bach, Chief Planner with the Tulare County Resource Management Agency, and we're here to present to the Planning Commission uh, the Legacy Plans. It's been a long time coming. This is GPA 17-033. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to Abigail Solis uh, with uh, Self Help, who's going to help me with this presentation, along with Dave Bryant, uh, 
special projects and forward planner for the county <clears throat> who's here to answer any questions you may have uh, if I cannot answer them. <clears throat> uh, GPA 17033 encompasses uh, basically five legacy plans. These are new to the county. Uh, GPA 17-025 through 17-030 and changes of zone 17-025 through 17-032 which also includes the mixed use combining zone which is section 18.9 as we have discussed previously and also by right uses expanding the by right uses within these communities section 16. Uh, I just wanted to make a note at this time that this is paid for through a, the Strategic Growth Council grant and that our views are our own and not necessarily theirs. Um, so with that, I'll quickly go through uh, what I want to do is a lot of the, the work that ultimately we're going to have to do for this project and presenting information to you. So we're going to do a lot of work today so that when we come back with the Hamlet development boundaries and the uh, urban development boundaries that we are going to uh, have plans for that we won't necessarily have to go through the grant process again with you. But I just want you to know how we got to this point. Uh, basically, it started off with what's called the uh, Cal EPA Enviro Screen. It's a tool uh, Cal EPA uses for grant funding purposes. And they use certain co cohorts, uh, poverty, health issues, and census blocks, and they combine that information. And they look at what communities have what they call the uh, um, tier one impacts. So it's a rating scoring uh, evaluation program. And the communities we have selected were in that highest tier. So they had the highest amounts of poverty, health issues uh, in, the, in the state. Um, and that's related to other California census blocks throughout the state. Uh, the RMA Legacy Plans mapping program looked at legacy um, communities, which are basically where there's 10 homes within a mile of each other in the last gubernatorial election uh, with uh, voters from the last gubernatorial election. They call that a legacy. And the whole idea is that cities would look at these legacies before they annexed other areas. Um, so these unincorporated communities would get annexed first. So that's the whole idea of our legacy plans. And the county's gone to the next step and we're actually going to create legacy plans. So uh, using those two tools, the EnviroScreen and our legacy program, we've come to the conclusion that these plans need to be updated. Plus, as I state in the next item, number two here, the housing element and the S. B244 plan that we've adopted also calls for recognizing legacy plans. So with our partnership with self-help and leadership, we were able to look at some more communities that we'll be bringing forward, uh, such as Rich Grove that weren't necessarily in the California Barrow Screen area, but that leadership thought we should, and self-help thought we should promote. And there's other communities that through our partnerships, we realized we just weren't going to get any feedback from the community, and so it wasn't necessarily worth our efforts to go out and uh, bring those in. So that's how we got to this point. Uh, so the legacy communities that have been selected are the El Monte Mobile Home Village, Hypericum, Jovista, Matheny, and Tuleyville. Uh, I'll go through and discuss each one of those later, but uh, those are the GPAs that are all encompassed under uh, 17-033. So that's GPA 17-025 through 17-030. Um, <clears throat> the grant funding process, we are three years in at this point. Yes, Mr. Letch. So you said that uh, the, uh, the idea is that the contiguous cities, that they would look at... That, that's the... And they've seen these first before they take any. That's the principle behind SB 244. And we've. Law or they, they no, that's just uh, guidelines basically for uh, LAFCO and for municipal service reviews. Part of their urban areas, so it's part of it anyway. Well, if they're within the, the sphere of influence. But that's the principle of it. And we've gone to the next level by getting to where we're at now, where we're actually going to. Uh, adopt legacy communities as part of our general plan. Anyway, so for three years, uh, we've been working on this project. Uh, and uh, we started with, uh, uh, from the administration, we've done the surveys. 
uh, which self-help has been very helpful in doing. I mean, we're talking over 50 meetings here. Uh, we're also talking about the, the qualification of this information. Uh, we not only created our own um, infrastructure plans uh, through the Action Program 9, uh, the housing element, but also we've gone out and looked at SB 244, like such as the legacy communities, and we've gotten service and infrastructure information, but we needed to qualify that to what the community residents are experiencing as well. So we have the qualification of the information through the surveys and then the, the, uh, the quantification and then the qualification of that information. So we've gotten to the point where we're presenting that information to you um, and then ultimately uh, we'll get to the Board of Supervisors. We had one previous presentation to LAFCO about a year ago where this uh, project was well received and I'll go through it in a little bit. It's already gone through the GPI uh, process, so uh, obviously. So the Board and the uh, LAFCO has, has heard, heard this. And then ultimately, uh, we will have indicators and outcomes, which will go back to SGC when we're done. And that will also require a Board of Supervisor approval. So with that, I'll turn it over to Abigail, where she'll present our, our outreach. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for the opportunity. So um, you may be familiar with self-help enterprises. We um, are known for housing, low-income housing development throughout uh, the Central Valley, but we also do community development uh, where we help small communities um, access water and, and sewer uh, projects. And we also are uh, very proud of our community outreach and engagement efforts that we're able to, to provide. So um, a little bit about the outreach team that worked on this project. Uh, like Erin mentioned, it consisted of self-help enterprises with some support from Leadership Council, uh, which is a nonprofit, as well as um, actual community committees. So we went, one of the reasons that self-help was selected is because we have ex existing relationships right now with actual small committees and communities. And whenever possible, we brought them on board to help us uh, spread the word about our effort. And of course, uh, plenty of help from the County of Tulare. So like Aaron mentioned, this was really a two-part effort, and I'm really uh, proud of Tulare County for the investment that they've made to ensure that these plans were developed with the community in mind. Um, like Aaron mentioned, we were going to hear about um, almost 50 meetings that we did to make sure that there was true uh, involvement from community. Uh, we started with individual surveys where we uh, went both door to door and had community meetings asking about uh, everyday issues that our families um, face. This was something that was not easy to do. Uh, like I mentioned, we did door-to-door, -door, we did meetings, we sent phone calls home with schools, we had flyers, we involved churches and local businesses. We wanted to make sure that every community we visited, everyone who should be part of this effort was, was there. So in total, uh, we had over 40 meetings and we collected almost 300 surveys. These surveys were really people telling us what life was like every day in these communities. We asked them what, you know, what their water and sewer condition was. We asked them, you know, how far they had to travel to the nearest grocery store or how far they had to travel to get to an emergency room if their child was, was sick. We, we asked them about sidewalks and road conditions as well as safety. So the information that we gained in these surveys was very critical and I would say probably the first time we ever learned this information about these, about these residents. Uh, those that um, did not do a survey uh, wanted to sign a petition in support of, the pro of, this, of this work, so we collected 65 petitions. Uh, in all of our meetings, over 600 community residents attended uh, all of our meetings, so we had great turnout. And we couldn't have done this without partnerships. Uh, there was 12 local utilities involved, and when I say utilities, I mean CSDs, PUDs, who helped, who either attended or spread the word or sent their board members to a meeting. 13 school districts, five Head Starts, uh, nine community groups, four churches, for a total of or over 42 community partners involved in this, in this effort. 
Community meetings are key. Um, again, I, I'm very proud of the work that we did on this project because we didn't assume anything. We encouraged participation, we listened to what people had to say, um, and we included their feedback in these reports. And as, as you see here, uh, these, these meetings were well attended. People were um, giving us real answers and real feedback as to how they felt about future growth in their community. So we couldn't have um, gathered this information without them and this project wouldn't have been as successful without these, these uh, many, many residents that attended multiple meetings to make sure we have captured the, the right information um, and that we were saying the right thing about what their future goals were and what their needs are in their communities. So uh, we, did a, we did a individual surveys and we also had to find a way to recap what the priority concerns were for each community. So there you, you see a resident for, from the community of Allensworth who has been very involved in, um, in the community for years and he's pointing at his top five priority concerns and he's, he's telling us that the number one issue that the community deals with and is worried about in Allensworth is sewer. Second would be of the possibility of energy and that's tied into the fact that they lack natural gas. Third is the road conditions. Fourth uh, is police because they live out in Allensworth. Uh, when they call the sheriff's department, sometimes it takes a while for the sheriff to get out there. One woman told me that by the time the sheriff gets there, the burglar would, you know, would be in her house, so she just pulls out her shotgun to scare him away. <laughs> well, she has to protect herself, so um, that is an issue. We documented that. I know that's above and beyond what we were, we were supposed to do, but just as an example of the information that we were able to collect uh, during, during this process. And fifth is internet. You will, I'm sure you'll learn that many of our communities lack internet access because they live so, so far out of town. So those five uh, top concerns were very reflective of the things that we learned in many of these communities. But of course we also had things like water issues, sidewalks, um, and like I mentioned, natural gas. So um, in, these, in these plans, as you read them, you will see individual lists of priority concerns for every community. The information that we gathered through this, through this survey was very, very helpful. Um, and we were able to document needs that had never been documented and, and update plans that hadn't been updated in either, either 20 or 30 years. When we go back to communities and we tell them, this is the information that we've collected with your surveys and with what you have told us and, and this is the report that has come out of it, they're very excited to know that because these plans have been updated, now there are environmental reports done and CEQA done that will help a project in their community move forward. We also were, um, we made sure that the community was aware of the land use changes, zoning changes and economic development um, that was, being implemented in their communities through these plans. So we, we told them that we were changing things to make it easier for, for a person who wanted to start a business in their home to do that. Uh, we explained to them the many benefits that were coming from these plans. So what you have here is an effort where people came to a meeting and had no idea why they were coming. They knew they were coming to talk about community growth and identify issues. And through a series of doing surveys, coming to community plans, uh, to community meetings to learn about these plans and returning to the last meeting, they were able to see how their information uh, transformed from just a need to, to a plan and show them how their community will grow through, through this effort. And of course, we end up with project ready communities, which is our ultimate, was our ultimate goal and, and a huge success. So with that, thank you, Abigail. Um, so the community plan studies we did, and I think in total we really looking at about 25 of them um, <clears throat> besides those we have for you today. Uh, we looked at the development boundary itself, uh, the, in this case the legacy development boundary, and we'll also look at hamlet development boundaries and urban development boundaries. And we looked at the locations, uh, we looked at the demographics, we definitely looked at the utilities. We did an environmental analysis, uh, we looked at services, and uh, we looked at what changes we can make either to the urban development boundary, the designation, which in pretty much every case is mixed use, and what rezones we could, could do. Uh, so the general plan elements that are, are going to need to change in order for us to actually incorporate legacy communities into our general plan are as stated here. 
uh, text will change to the introduction, uh, change to component A, the planning framework, a change to component B, uh, agricultural land use, component C, the scenic landscapes, environmental resource management sections of the general plan, air quality, component D, public facilities and financing elements, and of course the rural valley lands plan. These communities, for the most part, are already existing subdivisions. So all, all we're doing is putting a, a boundary around it and giving it, giving it a plan, but uh, it was always subject to the RVLP. So nothing really could go on there without going through that whole checklist process. So this will make economic development more feasible within these communities to, to remove these legacy communities out of that requirement. Uh, the planning amendment incorporates the county's general plan land use designation. As stated, these are all mixed use uh, Hamlet development boundaries when they came in in 2012 in the general plan were mixed use land use designation. <coughs> so we're just adding those to the legacy plans at this point. We are creating legacy development boundaries. Uh, circulation functional classification will now be uh, prescribed to these communities and the modification of urban expansion areas for open space development policies have all been incorporated into the legacy plans as policies. So, uh, as I was stating, uh, we're putting these legacy plans in the RVLP, in the general plan, and also in the land use plan for the county. Now, as far as the zoning, the entitlements we're going to create here, uh, the goals of our uh, re rezoning, as similar to some of the other communities we have done previously in front of this planning commission, is to bring uses into compliance with the general plan and zoning code. And I'll show you situations where that was necessary. Uh, to create economic development opportunities, of course, reduce land use conflicts, and reduce uh, reduction of the A1 zoning throughout the communities, which uh, creates quite a bit of uh, hassles for our, our department and our agency. Um, so the prescribed zones uh, within the legacy plans are, uh, we've prescribed the RA zone, RA43s, um, there will still be some AE20s, as you've seen. Uh, the R2, uh, increasing the density on either R1s or anything that was A1 or R, R, uh, RA, uh, we've now converted to R2s. Uh, we've added the mixed use overlay to some of these communities, so you see that in the C2 mixed use designation, the R3 mixed use designation, and in a couple of instances, the M1 light manufacturing designation. So our, our first example here is the El Monte Village, which is east of Dinuba. Uh, as you can see, it was previously zoned uh, agri for agriculture. Um, so it existed uh, previous to our, our zoning for the most part. Um, it's 4.41 acres, it's uh, 40 c 47 units approximately 155 person, uh, severely disadvantaged, uh, $22,000 a year for the medium household income. They have actually two public street lights, uh, and they have their own community sewage and water, and as I understand it, they should be very grateful to self-help to helping them with the water there. Uh, so we're looking for a simple rezone uh, from AE40 uh, to R3, which would make more sense at that location. Uh, Hypericum, 19.5 uh, acres, it's uh, 40 parcels plus or minus 50 units, uh, plus or minus 161 persons. It's very interesting when Abigail and I were out there, there was eight, eight people showed up to our meeting. And um, if you look at the census designated place, it shows four persons per household as a density. And I think I got laughed at when I presented that because there was probably, as I stated, 16 people at the house next door. So. There's quite a few more people in a lot of these communities, but since these designated places are so so large, it's really hard to get down to this level of, of survey. So again, we thank self-help for helping us get more information from these communities. They have zero public street lights, and they're all individual septic and water, and the um, idea for the rezone there was a lot of those existing uh, parcels are A1, so uh, along the frontage there, uh, the idea is to convert it to C2 mixed use to allow for com commercial potential and to RA43s, which will have less land use conflicts with some of the agricultural uses 
that there still exists there. And if Karen, I can just. What did you use for a database when you were checking the number of people per household? Was it the. Um, the, the American survey, American survey, it gives a, a forecast basically based on the census and they project it out to, I think, all the way out to 2015. Uh, the accuracy of it, uh, especially as you get into the rural areas, is, is not that great. Um, so it's really uh, Department of Finance numbers we were using. Did we ever determine what the actual population is of that community? You, yeah, I don't know if you'll ever really know what the actual population is of that community, but uh, be based on the four persons per household uh, and engaging that over uh, the 40 parcels, it's probably pretty close. The census designated place for high paracum goes all the way up into Farmersville. So you're not, you're not going to really get you have a lot of uh, agricultural uh, um, <coughs> parcels within that area, and you have parts of Farmersville in there. So it, it kind of moves, adjusts the numbers for the median income, as you can see, at 31,000. It's probably not that for, for Ipericum exactly. For uh, self help, I'm a past president of Catholic Charities for Visalia, and uh, we found that these homes of 16 people or multiple families and there are a lot of social issues when you have that many people like I have that problem with just six people in my house you know but there are social issues and uh, so when you are planning for housing do you put some sort of component in there to help yeah absolutely we problem? we consider every community that we worked in in one capacity or another but something to note um, that's related uh, where it says individual septic and water. So remember these, these communities, this community is not tied into a water or sewer system, which means they each have their own individual well. And this community was one of the ones affected by the drought. Um, so if you do drive down these two streets, every few houses you'll see those large temporary water tanks outside because they, a lot of them lost, um, lost the water that they had. So that's another reason why they, um, we are looking at them as a community that we want to continue to work with. We can fix utilities and things like that, but we, the social issues that go on in the house uh, between children and adults and uncle and children, that they're uh, pretty sad uh, sorts of things. And, uh, so do you guys look at the social issues within your projects to make sure that uh, children are being molested by Uncle John? Or? I think it's a little hard for us to determine those types of issues when we consider a, a community that we want to work in. We, I think we take in consideration uh, whether the community is ready to, to grow, um, whether there's a need for, for housing in that area, uh, but that's definitely something that we should consider, so I would take that back. Thank you. Yeah. In uh, our housing facility, we provided to be part of it, you were required to go to classes uh, and they were on things like your kids should go to school, personal <coughs> hygiene. So, I, I mean, I know you have community rooms that you do some things. Right. So is that p still part of your program? Oh, absolutely. Any of our uh, multifamily housing units, we provide those types of services. Um, of course, usually they're specific to our residents, but um, we do provide those. So uh, Jovista, which is along the uh, border of Kern and Tulare County, east of Delano, it's a, a community of 65.1 acres. It's 18 parcels, uh, plus or minus 17 units, plus or minus 68 persons. Median household income was $29,000 a year, which makes it severely disadvantaged. Uh, there are zero public street lights. Uh, they are all on individual septic and water. And uh, the zoning, uh, the rezone for them included uh, AE20s to C2 mixed use and RA43. So all these units were previously zoned AE20. Uh, the larger portion is still zoned AE20, but uh, there's no reason to change that at this time. Uh, the Matheny tract itself, south of Tulare. Uh, was started in 1947. It's 187 acres. It's within the city of Tulare's sphere of influence at this time. It's uh, 295 units, uh, plus or minus 1,043 persons. Median household income was $30,000 a year, also severely disadvantaged. They had two public street lights uh, with uh, potentially more, but uh, 
we couldn't see them at that time because sometimes the kids knock out the lights. Uh, there's six uh, sidewalk sections. Uh, all streets have at least some curbing. Uh, they had one bus stop and improvements to Pratt. Uh, they were very happy to hear about. Uh, the water is the city uh, currently, and they're discussing the feasibility for sewage, and I believe we'll have a comment from the city on that. Uh, they're still on septic. They have a storm drainage system through the irrigation district. So as far as utilities and infrastructure go, uh, Matheny has uh, more, more than most, uh, actually. Um, and the zone changes uh, we're suggesting here are from RAM to RA to remove the mobile home overlay and C2M to C2 mixed use, again, to create as much commercial opportunity so they won't have to commute the distances that Abigail was suggesting, even though the city of Tulare is pretty close by, it would be nice, as I'll show you in a section, uh, in a second here, to keep the jobs to housing ratio better and commute times down. And uh, finally, Tuleyville. Uh, this is uh, 38.7 acres, uh, plus or minus 78 households, according to the CDP. Uh, again, the accuracy of it might be a little bit off. Uh, plus or minus 391 persons. Median household income was uh, 27,000. There is one public street light. Uh, public drainage public sewer and water uh, with uh, some issues as discussed in the plan itself. The zone changes suggested were from A1, RAM, uh, and AE20 to RAs, again, redu reducing the use of the mobile home overlay. And C1, there was one commercial lot and uh, in the previous zone plan and RAM to C2 mixed use, again, to promote as much economic development opportunity as possible within Tuleyville. <clears throat> as far as environmental analysis, uh, what we are, uh, what the process we have gone through is using a finding of consistency, which is similar to what we did for the Porterville area plan. And if there were any changes to the findings of consistency in addendum, <coughs> um, to the 2012 general plan EIR. Uh, staff did find that these projects overall, because there is not a whole lot of acreage associated and we're not changing that much acreage from the original baseline, was consistent with the addendum to, or consistent with the 2012 general plan EIR. Uh, and the whole idea of this, and it is a uh, sustainable grant that we have got is a better jobs to housing balance with an increase in non-residential zoning. Uh, so the, the actually what we're looking at right now, um, a good idea is to have a quarter of all your development be commercial or industrial. Uh, if you look at the existing zoning out there, it's not even a percent as to what was commercial or non-residential. So it was mostly still an ag, and it was mostly still, uh, like I was saying, residential. So that generates quite a bit of traffic as far as jobs and shopping. Uh, so we want a better jobs to housing balance, which we are finding through this addendum. Uh, and ultimately, uh, this generates uh, less traffic and less greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, we put in a memo that shows an overall reduction of course, you want to take your, your worst case scenario, and if you looked at just the pure amounts of zoning we have created through the legacy plans, it, it, it would look bad as far as a worst case scenario. But the reality is this county grows at a 1.3% growth rate. So we, we want to be look at the worst case scenario, but we don't want to be overly speculative. So we find that this, uh, this plan itself uh, is consistent with the general plan as far as our GHG emissions and ultimate reduction. Uh, as far as water use, since we are just coming out of this drought, water use reductions with, uh, there will be a reduction in agricultural uses, which will automatically reduce the overall uh, water usage for each one of these communities. But uh, there was a question last week about Sigma. Sigma itself is not applicable until 2018, really, because to do anything else would be speculative and we won't know what the water balances are or the sustainable yields until that time. I do sit on two Sigma technical committees and we're, we're at least a year out before we know any of those numbers for the uh, mid Kauia or the East Kauia. 
Um, agriculture is generally protected by our general plan under the RVLP. So designating already developed land uh, doesn't really affect it that much. That so was as far as all the protection, all the mitigation measures are already in our general plan. So the acreages we're talking about are less than 50 acres for each one of these legacy communities. And as I stated, they're mostly built out. So to remove them from the RVLP doesn't necessarily um, require a large scale conversion of agriculture. So again, this was all consistent with the general plan, 2012 general plan EIR. RVLP in their general plan. Thank you. <laughs> the, the, you can look at a myriad of our use permits or our zoning changes that have used the RVLP checklist. But yes, we, we can provide the form for you. But uh, yes, we've used it on quite a quite a few projects. Whenever we give you that RVLP score, that's the checklist we've used. But that's it's pretty well laid out in the general plan itself. And so with that, that completes a staff presentation. I'd like to uh, open up to the Planning Commission's comments before we open up the public hearing here. I'll do a lightning round with you here. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued by these communities. I always have been. I have some friends that grew up in Tuleyville. Um, What's the total population of all the legacy communities as a percent of the total unincorporated area? Boy, that is a, a hard question. You just have to ask me right I mean, now. I could add up all these <laughs> numbers that you've estimated for the, the, the various communities here. Uh, but the, the, the reason I'm asking is, it, do we manage these all as a group, as a zone or a district, or we handle them individually? They'll be handled individually. I mean, I'm just guessing off the top of my head around, around 1,700 persons, maybe, and as a percentage of the unincorporated area, you know, yeah, one, probably around 2%, 1%. Percent, that's what I was thinking. So do we get funding from the state to support? You know, we have two very wealthy areas, the Bay Area and Southern California, and the coastal area. We have all this money floating around. And we're going well, after funding to fix these problems, right? Right. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, this grant itself was was a fight with those two areas. And uh, in early on discussions about that whole Enviro screen checklist, uh, we went up to Sacramento to discuss that with Cal EPA, saying, you know, you, you give us these large census blocks, you know, where the small census blocks, and you really – keeping us out as far as the evaluation criteria from getting any of the money. And so, it, it, like I said, it was quite a, quite a fight to get just this money here. Um, and then moving forward, it's, uh, it's getting tougher and tougher. The advantage is we have this severely disadvantaged communities, so that on the evaluation criteria pushes us uh, up. But as far as the Enviro screen, we're – and before they were using zip zip codes, which are even bigger down here. So it, it's a it's a fight with those those areas, definitely. So we're, we are doing our best in self-help as well. And we made it a, a real effort to make sure that communities, well, these small communities realized how fortunate they were to receive the funding to do this work. And I think that's one of the reasons why we had such a great success with community involvement, because it's not every day that the county comes to their community and wants to see how we can help. Yeah. So they really appreciated that, and in turn, that's why we had so many people participate. Well, there's various reasons why they were originally created historically. Uh, and the, the thing that's interesting here is uh, and th this is to Ed's concern continually about, you know, we, 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 we see projects that are mobile home clusters. We're adding more mobile homes. And how do we monitor, you know, we know what these are right here. How do we monitor that we're not growing another legacy community someplace and then we end up having the same problems? We have to deal with the water, the environment, the social issues, all of that. Um, so this great that we're going to focus on these and fix these and the cities that are around them or near them that are in their sphere of influence do, are they on, are, are they obligated to take care of some of this financially well uh, I, I don't 
I mean, they allowed. I, them I don't to think grow. that I mean, they, they are absolutely to obligated to do so. I mean, these are by law or otherwise. Uh, like I said, it's a little bit on the guideline side. Yeah. Um, so uh, they're supposed to consider these communities before they annex other areas. Um, but like I said, the county itself is taking a lot of responsibility here by going out to these legacy communities. We've get, gone way beyond what the grant requires in, to my, to my individual feeling, way beyond what SB 244 requires to, to have gone to the lengths <coughs> we have. Uh, so, um, you know, moving forward, we, we do have the RVLP checklist to definitely prohibit developments uh, such as uh, El Monte uh, on agricultural zone land. Um, and we do obviously bring those projects to you as far as use permits. Uh, so we, they, it's discretionary. Mm -hmm. uh, and then ultimately the real concern, do they ever go to get the building permits and that's the other aspect that a lot of this rezoning will solve because it prohibits a lot of people when they have to get use permits or change their zoning to even ask uh, to go through the building permit process so we were fortunate today to hear uh, an applicant who through the building permit process actually came in and brought their projects into compliance with the use permit requirements so that's a rarity so th this at least gives us the opportunity to, to manage it better. How many more of these type of uh, legacy projects are out there in the county? Well, well Dave, I don't think we have an absolute number. It's uh, probably in the magnitude of 70. Yeah, 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 yeah around 70 in the SB 244 inventory for the county. And so we're covering five of them. Well, we are covering those that overlapped with the, uh, and those include some hamlets as well as I understand it, but um, those are the ones that overlapped in the uh, uh, Cali virus screen. So, I thought these were all there were. That, that was no. a great question because no. I didn't know there were 70 more. Well, no, there. there's, there's, I mean, you got the mount, mountain zones and you have the um, FGMP areas, development corridors. So the, the, we're talking the valley floor here. And if you looked at the, I didn't bring the map, but it, uh, the Enviro screen really looked along Highway 99 where you have the most health issues probably from the air quality emissions along 99, but that's uh, that's real focus of this study. You just went through all of the criteria for establishing the, the, the elements you're gonna develop for these legacy communities. All these others that we don't know about, what, what are we doing there then? Are, as they come up on a one-off basis, we just take care of them, is that what happens? <laughs> well, uh, like I said, we have the, uh, you gotta, also look at, we haven't uh, changed our zoning code since the early 70s. So this is uh, an opportunity at this time because we got this grant funding to do this work. Uh, there's no immediate plans uh, to really do this for these other communities we're talking about. But the, the, the fact that we even incorporated them under or, or looked at them under our housing element goes beyond what pretty much any other jurisdiction is doing in the state of California. So, yes, it might be a case-by-case -case basis in the future, but I, I'm, I'm just happy to get where we're at here today. So we as a planning commission, as we look at these going forward, will there be some uh, mechanism to give us a trigger point when we see something that we know what we're dealing with as far as a, a legacy? Potential legacy community. Uh, we we could reference those uh, when we do our staff reports and our agenda items that they were recognized in the SB 244 report as a, as a legacy community, it, especially as we do our general plan consistency findings. We could we could definitely do that. But moving forward for these legacy communities, they they will be they will be in there. Because some of these are derived from uh, being a labor camp sort of thing, right? Historically. Well, you know, Matheny was a full full scale subdivision. You know, so uh, Joe Vista, maybe, probably, uh, seventeen years. Tuleyville, Tuleyville definitely. Tuleyville definitely. Um, so yes, uh, to answer your question, a lot of them were created with that in mind, but they've definitely expand expanded beyond whatever anybody ever really intended them to be. And then with the densities you have, 
And with the densities you have, it's really tough catching up with the infrastructure. So where a farmer or a rancher now has a, a labor con con component on their property, well, if they if they they're have, providing housing. If they have pure that, employee we're not housing, that right? Yeah, if they have pure employee housing, no, we're not. Right, we're right. not considering that. Just, just for clarification, um, Commissioner Whitlatch, she asked about the RVIP. It's uh, it's in your packet. It's Exhibit A13 on on page um, 857 of your packet. <laughs> <laughs> but it's pit. there, and that shows the, and, and, it, and it's very small chapters, very small element. It's basically the consisting of a few policies, but it's really the checklist and the point system uh, is, is there and included. So for that, and again, what we're looking at, we're not really looking at expanding. These are existing communities that that would probably, for the most part, not be approved at this point in time. But we're just we're just identifying them. We're we're identifying the infrastructure deficiencies. What's there? needs of the community, response time by emergency vehicles, all that type of thing to be able to be set in a position to be able to go after grant funding to make improvements to those conditions. And that's what we're, we're able to do today with, with these communities. The reason I ask that question is I've had a particular farmer who was concerned that he would lose his right to farm. And I just want to... Well, just to, to <coughs> clarify that issue, and just to clarify one thing, that was page 857, Mike? 857, yeah. Uh, page 857. Um, yes, uh, the, uh, the, the, Goshen. The, the, again, these are existing, existing developments. So just because some of them become more by right when they move forward under the building permit it doesn't really change the status of uh, the right to farm. Uh, right to farm is two things. One, it's a disclosure in your real estate documents, as you're probably well aware of. But also, it uh, goes with our use permits. Uh, so when we or our rezones. So if we give somebody a, a new by right, they are notified at that time that the neighbors have a right to farm. So it doesn't necessarily change that status at all. So the RVLP doesn't really go to that. The right to farms a standalone code section in our Tulare County uh, code. So from now on when we see a mobile home enclave uh, and someone wants to add one more for their grandfather. For the what? For their grandfather. Okay. Uh, I like Or grandmother. Uh, <laughs> do we have a set of a checklist of things we can say well? Uh, does it have this, 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 and this? I mean, you know, you laid it out yeah. here. Well, as far as that, you, you're talking about if we're adding a second residence or a third well, residence. we're creating an enclave that could be, you know, getting bigger. I don't, uh, in most cases, we're talking second residences or third residences right. for use permits right. in the agricultural zones. Right. You're not likely to create those. We do, as we talk about, have one of the best employee housing uh, programs in the state of California where you could get 11 uh, units and those have the potential but they're not split out separate lots so they're not for sale they haven't been subdivided so they exist on that that lot and they do exist on ag land on ag land, on yeah. on ag but, land. but the ones you were saying there's like per perhaps 70 more um, lots those are existing uh, parcels uh, of these what? Legacy. Legacy community type things. They have existing parcels, so they were subdivided. So, by are them. there are the, uh, how many people are we? You know, is there? Do we do we know how many average number of people there are in those others? You mean uh, those other the legacy? ones we, that we don't have in this list here? There's five. I would say here. it's probably fairly consistent. Uh, again, this is in the RVLP area. If you go up into the FGMP area into the mountains, you obviously reduce the densities. And but do we know that they're homes, or are they a combination of homes and, and mobile? They are a combination of co homes and mobile homes. Okay. Depending on the community, and, and we'll get into that more when we go through the HDBs in Allensworth and West Goshen, but. And for the most part, legal, they are split out lots. So a moralistic not, question, and it's a legal question, and you can't tell people you don't. You know, you got to move, you got to disperse. You can't all live here together. I understand that you have a right to live where pretty much wherever you want. But do we not have some guidelines to say you can't do this without? services that include this and this and this and this. Well, we do have guidelines from environmental health as far as septic and water 
Uh, we do have guidelines as far as if they're in proximity to city or any ID uh, infrastructure that they do have to hook up to those. Uh, so there's there's a whole process we go through with will serve letters and everything else to make sure that they do have sufficient infrastructure to serve their projects. Um, and that's and that that's true for these legacy communities regardless. So like I was saying, we're not in danger of creating new legacy communities by having employee housing because those aren't subdivided. Right. And uh, if they do subdivide, we have the checklist within the subdivision map act and our own zoning to make sure that they fulfill all the requirements of our development standards and environmental health standards. Right, well, that's Here, I, I've got a con you know, this complicated. is been my pet peeve, as you guys know this. I hate seeing this uh, on, on, on ag ground, ag zoning, and the fact that you're rezoning it is what I've been saying all along. Rezone it and get them the tools and, 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 and the money and stuff that the, to improve it, the infrastructure and stuff uh, with the proper zoning. Uh, having said that, and then at the risk of being labeled inconsiderate or uh, insensitive, uh, uh, as part of the con uh, 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 thought going into this is maybe phasing out some of these. And just uh, m there's a point where we're spending. So there's there, you cross the threshold. It's cheaper to buy them a house downtown than it is to try to save this spot right here with infrastructure and all the rest of that stuff. So I I don't know. Uh, well, you know, you look at El Monte, and it's a mobile home village, so it's 155 persons. I don't know if the Dinuba would be interested in in moving those those people. And Matheny is about a thousand thousand uh, that, persons. That's so. a lot. Uh, and and th those are the ones. Are these are these uh, typical? Are these uh, or smaller or larger than the other 65? Uh, I'd say okay. for the most part these are uh, larger. I think yeah. they represent lar larger areas. So, um, so my comment really probably wouldn't address these, but uh, th there's there's another 65 or so of these, and we haven't even talked about the hamlets yet. No, you you will we will we will discuss the hamlets. Uh, and so I mean, is there uh, is some of the thought process going to maybe rather than spending all this money throwing good money uh, uh, after bad that we just move these people? Buy well, my house and move them. That that and, that that, that is a that is a good question. Out and farm us. That is a good good question. Uh, I think it goes well beyond uh, the grant that we received, but it would be a <coughs> uh, interesting study to see the uh, cost benefit ratios of of move, moving folks. I don't see any immediate plans on the horizon under our general plan or. Uh, Tulare County Code. In, infrastructure, pipelines. Would, would self-help become involved in that, that kind of stuff? <laughs> I, just, just for clarification, try to keep this on track. It, <laughs> Thank really, you. that's not well, the question is. here. There, there would be many concerns there because most of these people, a lot of them aren't necessarily owner-occupied. They're renters. Then, then it's who's getting land. <coughs> this is not really what we're looking at. These are existing communities. They're well established. They are larger of the ones that are considered those uh, legacy communities because of SB 244. Many of those clusters are cabins in the in the mountains and different areas. These are the ones on the valley floor that fit the criteria for this grant that we were able to, to get. We're really not, this isn't for expanding these communities. It's not growing these communities. These communities are where they're at. We're trying to improve the quality of those communities, and that's really what we're looking at here. Right. Well, then. And if I could just add to the question of self-help, um, when we work out in these communities, sometimes we do get questions about, you know, is self-help planning on building here anytime soon? And if that's just not feasible, we always tell them where we are building, and that provides an opportunity for moving if that's what they choose to do. And it's not just people in these legacy communities that decide to move. Sometimes it could be somebody that lives in Teveston that wants to move to, you know, the city of Tulare or somebody who lives in Tuleville that wants to move to Goshen, you know, to somewhere where we're, bu we're building. So they're offered the same opportunity. Um, but somebody asked earlier about um, 
this uh, sphere of influence and how the, the neighboring community, for example, in Tuleville, uh, they are very close to the city of Exeter and the city of Exeter has not been mandated to work with them, but I know that they are considering and they have been working, tr attempting to work together um, on their water issues for some time now. Uh, when you talk about Hypericum, the nearest community there is uh, the city of Farmersville. However, they're four miles out and I know that Farmersville would be interested in, you know, in helping them if they could, but four miles is a little further than, you know, one mile or two like we're dealing with, I think, in, in Tuleville. So um, the neighboring communities are interested in helping, um, but sometimes it's just a, a little further and you have to think about the pipeline, the miles of pipeline that um, we would have to invest. Um, also, in terms of these these communities, we have some communities that families have been living there for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, you know, they've lived, they live there, their parents and their grandparents have lived there. So the, the thought of asking them to uh, pick up and move um, seems a little unfair if, you know, if maybe their, their families or ancestors built that home there 20 or 30 years. So I think it's something that we have to consider as, as well. Uh, yeah, and I understand, and there's a lot of well, we, 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 aspects of this. We, we're, we're, but when a freeway comes in, it's sad, but they take your house anyway. Yeah. We're, we're a commission. Well, well, well. We're a commission that's supposed to rule on land use, but at the same time, as I'm hearing here, like things that Bill said, we're also concerned about the welfare of the people and safety and welfare and, and the, the things that go on in these communities sometimes aren't very nice. We should be concerned about that. Too. Absolutely, and that same. And I'm glad that you're concerned because what you're telling me is you're concerned for the constituents of Tulare County. And the issue that you see in these legacy communities is no different than what you see in the community of Early Mart. In the community of Early Mart, the census says we have about nine or ten thousand people. I know for a fact we have more like thirteen or upwards of fourteen thousand people because I see them every day. So where are they living if they're not documented? They're probably living four or five, maybe even ten to to a, a, an individual household. So I would like to see each community grow. I'd like to. See opportunities for new housing in all of these communities, not just legacy. So I, I urge you to consider that this is not just something happening in these specific legacy communities, it's happening all over the county. You know, the, the bigger cities have the problem in spades. I'm not saying, that I, we just want to make sure these people aren't being taken right. advantage Absolutely. of. Absolutely. Well, and this is, this is the starting point. It's a recognition by the county of these legacy communities. And it's our opportunity at this time to recognize what we can under our grant. So this is the this is what I've been telling these communities. This is the first step. You know, this is the first, the first step, step to a long Aaron, long process. I have a question. Um, we were talking about the one community that's the mobile home community, four acres. Uh, El, El Monte. El Monte. And you were you brought up a very good point about most of them are renters. A mobile home park, isn't that owned by usually one person or entity? Correct. So I'm kind of surprised, how does that, if that's an owner, why is that in the program? I, I'm a little confused on that. I understand the, the there individual There could, there could be individual owners, so it did qualify for a legacy community within those mobile homes, so not necessarily all uh, renters, so to say. Uh, maybe they rent the space, but I believe that they qualify because of the ownership of the, the units themselves. Um, <clears throat> again, this was what was qualified for the Enviro screen, as well as having the requirements for SB 244. So if it was on, the, where the maps joined together, it was in proximity to a city, it was it was included. Yeah, we were not able to actually access the, uh, to do any workshops in, in El Monte, but uh, again, because of the proximity to the city and because of the amount of persons there, we, we decided to actually give this legacy status. Because, you know, because who I am. <clears throat> I'm very nervous about us coming out and saying, we're changing the zone and taking away ag land to put to zone these particular. Now, saying that, I know it's silly to think how many years, I, I know Tuleville's been there forever. And it's been at, and it's had the zoning the same forever. Did Tuleville go away? No, it did not. It just became more suppressed, you know. So I understand that, but it's a very slippery slope. And we're aware of that. 
And that's why I stated earlier in our environmental studies, we looked at the RVLP and the potential loss of land through agricultural conversion. As you are aware, we do have new mitigation measures if projects are five acres or more to actually do ag <coughs> mitigation at a one-to-one -one ratio. These exist, like I was saying. These exist. So we're not... I don't, I don't think we're in danger of losing any more agricultural land than was already considered in the general plan in 2012. These HDBs, UDBs, and these legacy areas already exist. So, no, that's, I, I don't believe that's a true, true threat to ag land. And we're not increasing their size. No, we're no, just staying not, not at all. No. And, and just, just to clarify again, on, on, on like for say this, this particular one, what might result, what, what would be the end result of this? Potentially, with this identified as a legacy community, we may be able to benefit in getting a bus stop put out front and some things like that that benefit the community and, and transportation. Those are the types of things that, that, by recognizing it as a legacy community in this plan through this grant, that's what we're setting up. We're setting up to be able to obtain those types of things, those fundings for those types of uh, improvements or amenities that may improve the condition some of them are uh you know there's only one street light or no street light maybe we can get a couple more street lights in there and pr improve the safety you know those are the types of things that were the real quick easy fixes that we we can look for for this this really isn't it's not converting agriculture to other uses because these are already existing they're not they're zoned ag but they're not ag they haven't been agged and they'll never be ag again uh, so they're just identifying what's already existing on the on the ground. And in opposite of what uh, Mr. Diaz was saying, that because we zone this to R3, it doesn't necessarily need to stay a mobile home under its use permit anymore. This could become something better. That's why they call it up zoning. This could become an apartment complex. This could become some form of multifamily. So it, there's an opportunity that we've created here versus the owner having to pay tens of thousands of dollars to go through the rezone and the sequel process. They're already, they're already covered, so this is more of an opportunity. I'm glad to see that self-help's been involved in this because they, they're, they're in a lot of communities, and this is a nice presentation. <coughs> but, uh, and perhaps you've already thought of this, but you know, I, I'd li I mean, I would like to hope that you network with other Thing, organizations such as Catholic Charities, that just because I was the president, <coughs> there are others. There's the um, Alliance for uh, Homeless, which is more than just homeless. They attract all the different people who try to provide services to the poor in Tulare County. I, I appreciate that comment, and there is a whole uh, department um, in our um, organization called the Resident Services, and they're, that's what really what they're tasked with, partnerships and providing services to our residents and potential new residents, so I definitely will, will bring that up. And they may have partnered with them in the past, so it's just not where I work every day, but they, that department is there. And Quia Delta has a big presence in uh, Exeter. Uh, my daughter is a uh, what is she? social worker, that's it, and uh, she contracts and she deals with a lot of those communities, so. Yeah, they definitely the need the support. To be part of your plan too. So. Great. Well, all right. What do we do now? Forward. We'll <laughs> make a motion. Well, just so I'll you're all aware, we, we have to. Pub we, we have a. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. We will uh, open the public hearing, but uh, just so you're aware, we still have early mark to do too. Yeah. <laughs> And many, many motions. So uh, the suggestion is to open and close the public hearing. So begin so by we'll opening open the public hearing to see if there's anybody who wants to add to this, uh, what's already been presented. Good morning, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. My name is Mel Malika, uh, principal planner presenting the city of Tulare. And I would like to read into the record uh, city position, comment and position regarding the general plan amendment uh, 17029 Matheny track legacy plan. It's a good plan, a lot of efforts spent and uh, put into this plan to become successful. <coughs> uh, but the city uh, position is specifically related to what is stated in the plan regarding the Matheny track wastewater system project feasibility report and the addendum uh, technical memorandum evaluating uh, the <coughs> alternative wastewater collection line. 
Uh, the city of Tulare is respectfully um, rejecting alternative one and two as not adequately addressing the city uh, future need. This is related to the imposition of additional uh, operation and maintenance obligation on the city, as well as constraining future improvement to the city's wastewater collection system. Uh, studies have indicated that alternative th uh, three would accommodate plan future city growth and uh, the Metheny track service area. It would do so in a manner uh, in substantial conformance with the city's uh, sewer um, master plan. However, significant questions uh, remain regarding the funding of required improvement to the city's wastewater collection system. Uh, the city of Tulare has indicated that it does not have funding, alternative uh, or funding available to contribute toward the costs of improvements. Uh, this issue will need to be resolved to the satisfaction of all affected parties before any alternative is selected for the implementation. Thank you. Uh, does, uh, just for the record, uh, Hector did or is in the process of doing an environmental impact report for this project. Uh, so I'll defer to him at this time. Well, I was just going to say if you could get, if you have a letter for, for to input it into the record or just your verb, it would be great if we'd have a written record. But um, there's a, uh, a proposed, uh, uh, there was a grant a few years ago for uh, looking at a feasibility study for wastewater treatment for Matheny track and alternatives included connecting to the city's, city of Tulare's wastewater uh, plant. That environmental review is still going forward. Uh, there's, there's an EIR being prepared. There's a technical memo. There's um, a feasibility study as well. So this is something that's really not point on this, but it will be for that project and, and it's well known the, the city's position on that. And, uh, when, when the environmental document comes out, probably in, uh, well, it's out, but when, it, it, when, it, when it's final uh, and comes to the Board of Supervisors in December, uh, it, we're, we're well aware of the city's position on that. So I don't think that hinders. I'll let, I'll let Hector um, uh, provide additional information, but I, I don't think at this point this really does anything for the plan itself, but that's for the, that project, yeah. Isn't the uh, city of Tulare required because their their plants are paid for with federal funds to uh, provide the service? Uh, this is beyond the scope of what we're discussing, <laughs> so I wouldn't. Uh, I, I think we just need to focus on the the okay. legacy plan itself, and that's, and that's a discussion for right. at future point in time when the board of supervisors considers okay. the environmental impact report. Right. If I could just uh, Hector Garrett, chief environmental planner, RMA. Uh, I can just give you an overview of what we're doing. Uh, we did indeed prepare a draft environmental impact report for this project. Uh, we did receive late comments from the city. Uh, we did receive a study done by their consulting engineer uh, on the last day of the commenting period. So new information was brought to light. We did have a technical addendum to our feasibility study, which provided additional new information that has come to light. In that technical memorandum for the addendum, it included additional alternatives. Uh, in summary, the project Matheny is basically, uh, they're all on individual septic. Uh, they, they, they don't have that community sewer. They have community water now, so thanks to the city for providing that. They took over the water company there, so that's one step forward in the infrastructure. But now we're at the, the sewer component. Uh, so that said, uh, we investigated as part of the EIR and the feasibility study uh, developing a community wastewater collection system with a 10 or 12 inch main line uh, on Pratt Avenue going north to the city of Tulare's Page Avenue trunk line. Uh, the feasibility study that we conducted did not weigh the city's concerns regarding uh, capacity. Well, we, in, we, we in analyzed the, the capacity for the wastewater treatment plant. But the city wanted to investigate the conveyance, AKA the pipeline, the 27 inch pipe, take Matheny's and then go into the wastewater treatment plant. The city came back with, uh, 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 a, I guess a counter alternative asking us to explore three things in addition to what we call alternative to the preferred connection to the city of, of Tulare. Those three alternatives are a 24 inch 
dedicated line that goes from, uh, parallels the existing city line on Page Avenue, go to the wastewater treatment plant. That was one. The second one was a 27 inch line, which would, uh, keep in mind the 27 inch line that's already there is gonna stay, it's not gonna go anywhere. This is an additive line, this is an extra line. So, but the, the, the parameters of that one would extend from Hay Street on the east to the wastewater treatment plant where uh, Matheny would connect to that. That the city was indicating that it would accommodate already approved but yet developed proposals, development proposals, and what they are calling near term growth. So that will accommodate the city also, plus Matheny. Then they went the big guy, as they call him the big kahuna, the 42 inch line, which would not only really accommodate Matheny, it would also accommodate literally the southwest portion of the city and all of their future planned growth. Now, you, know, you can say what you want to about these projects, but the project started off with connecting Matheny to the wastewater treatment plant, the 27 inch line going there. So new information was brought to light. So with, with that, we're going to evaluate in what's called a recirculated EIR. So virtually the whole conversation, the draft is gonna stay the same, but what we're going to explore are those alternatives that the city is suggesting. So now what's <coughs> gonna happen there? I, uh, we still typically have a 45 day review period, but I'm, I've already called the affected agencies and I got two approvals to get that down to 30 days. I still need one more call. So once we do that, instead of the 45 day, it'll be a 30 day review period. When that comes back, then we'll, 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 we'll final the EIR and we'll take that to the, uh, to the Board of Supervisors for their consideration of action. Now, I, I don't know the total results of what's gonna happen, but that document, my hope is to get that released next Friday. And everybody who is on that, the thing called the notice of preparation, the notice of availability, anybody who commented on it is going to receive that document likely next Friday. So the sixth, not this Friday, the next Friday. So we have to go through another sequel process that we'll be given 30 days to be given their comments and then we'll go forward with it to the board. So right now, with uh, respect to the city, uh, we are evaluating that that is a separate issue from what we're talking about today and we are addressing it. We do hope that the communities that we are talking about and I just wanna remind the planning commission, we're setting up the legacy boundaries to say, you can do this within here, outside of that you <coughs> can't. You know, there's still a, a, a review. Just because it's a by right doesn't mean we don't look at stuff. We look at everything, water, sewer, traffic, all that stuff, flood control, we look at all that stuff too. So it's not like somebody can just plot something into one of our legacy communities. But the Matheny track is one of the larger ones, subdivision started in 47, and it, it needs to have a, a wastewater treatment. Uh, one alternative, and I can back up a little bit, one alternative exp what, that was explored was a standalone facility, you know, for them to have their own wastewater treatment. But that uh, was, was ruled infeasible because it's very expensive and, and it's just not efficient. You don't have the economies of scale. So that's an ongoing conversation with the city of Tulare. You know, we've engaged them. Uh, right now, they're, they're not too receptive to it, but we hope through you know, uh, talking with whomever the powers that be that, that we're gonna be able to resolve that you know, favorably for everyone. And just uh, for the record, these wastewater <coughs> issues are discussed at pages 1,106 and 1,107 of the record for the legacy communities. Uh, th everything in, in total that was discussed today is discussed there. Is there anyone else who would like to make comment? I, I, you know, I don't see this as an immediate problem anyway because there is no sewage system anyway. So everybody's on septic and uh, so, but we are charged as a planning commissioner just to remind everyone of the health, safety, and the welfare of the community. And so even though this is outside the scope, it's important that we ask these questions to make sure uh, people are uh, considered it. Considered health, safety, and welfare. So. But this time we will close the public comment and we will uh, so we can uh, <clears throat> proceed by uh, going, unless there is any other discussion, proceed by going through each one of these motions. There is uh, five of them. So uh, it, it's the uh, commission's uh, wish to have staff read them or yes, to do, the, it is? Okay. Uh, so uh, the uh, first motion is in regards to CEQA. It's the uh, 
The, what the Planning Commission is doing is recommending to the board the following motions. Uh, certification and adoption of the addendum to the 2012 Tulare County 2030 General Plan Final Environmental Impact Report for the Legacy Plan's 2017 update. Uh, I'll make that motion to, on this uh, phase here. I'll as, second the motion. <coughs> as stated by uh, staff. A vote, please. Strong? Yes. Bailey? Yes. 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 Whitlatch? Yes. Pitigliano? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. The Planning Commission makes the following recommendation to the Board of Supervisors. Adoption of the General Plan Amendments Number GPA 17-033 for the Legacy Plans 2017 Update inclusive of El Monte Mobile Village, GPA 17-025, Hypericum, GPA 17-026, Jovista, GPA 17-027, Matheny Tract, GPA 17-029, and Tuleyville, GPA 17-030, and amendments to Part 3 of the Tulare County General Plan to establish legacy plans and legacy development boundaries to the Part 1 General Plan Amendments to the Introduction, Component A, Planning Framework, Component B, Agriculture, Land Use, Component C, Scenic Landscapes, Environmental Resources Management, Air Quality, Component D, Public Facilities and Financing Elements, and Part 2, Rural Valley Lands Plan, consistent with the Legacy Plan's 2017 update. I make the motion as stated. I'll second that motion. A vote? Long? Yes. Billy? Yes. 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 Whitlatch? Yes. Pigliano? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. The Planning Commission makes the following recommendation to the Board of Supervisors. Amendment, amend Section 18.9 of Ordinance Number 352, the Zoning Ordinance, and establish the mixed-use combining zone with the El Monte Mobile Village Hypericum, Jovista, Matheny Tract, and Tuleyville Legacy Development Boundaries. I'll make that motion as stated. I second that. Vote. Strong? Yes. Bailey? Yes. Yes? Yes. Whitlatch? Yes. Pitigliano? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. The Planning Commission makes the following recommendation to the Board of Supervisors to amend Section 16 of Ordinance Number 352, the Zoning Ordinance, to allow additional by-right uses within the El Monte Mobile Village, Hypericum, Jovista, and Tuleyville Legacy Developments. Got the Matheny track, but that's okay. We uh, were uh, <clears throat> concerned uh, for the city's concerned to have that many more by right uses in Matheny tract so we did not include the by right uses within Matheny they would still need to go to the use permit process there is okay no, no. thank you that was originally stated no no I'll, I'll, I'll move to accept that as stated by staff second I second that vote Strong. Yes. Bailey? Yes. 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 Whitlatch? Yes. Pigliano? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. <clears throat> the Planning Commission makes the following recommendation to the Board of Supervisors to amend Ordinance Number 352, the Zoning Ordinance, as set forth in the Zoning District Ordinance maps for El Monte Mobile Village, Hypericum, Jovista, Matheny Tract, and Tuleyville, consistent with the Legacy Plans. 2017 updates to rezone certain properties within El Monte, Mobile Village, Hypericum, Jovista, Matheny Tract, and Tuleyville. I'll make that motion as stated. I'll second. Vote. Strong? Yes. Haley? Yes. 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 Whitlatch? Yes. Pigliano? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Could, could, could I... Uh, be so, be, no. <laughs> I'd be so bold as to add an additional recommendation, and then you can tell me no, go fly a kite, whatever. Uh, through the uh, chair, uh, go I'm, for I'm, it. I, well, so I'm, <laughs> I, I'm going to recommend that the, the creation of an evaluation and monitoring programs or plans for the purpose of 
managing clustering slash enclaves of and in an unincorporated areas within the county, parentheses to include permanent and temporary slash mobile structures, deliverables and dates to be determined by February 1st, 2018. So uh, just a question to the commission, uh, would you be looking to do this through the zoning code, through the general plan, or through our section 16 use permit requirements? What would you recommend? <laughs> well, I just, just for <laughs> clarification that, that that's really not in the scope of this general plan amendment. Seek was been product, uh, conducted on this. If this is something that the commission desires to bring forward as a separate recommendation for policy or, or whatever, that's something we that's can okay. consider. But it's really not part okay, of this, and, and Seek was already announced. I'm good with that. Yeah. I'm good with it. Do it as a, as a separate. Something we will bring a staff report or something in, right. in, after after we get past the cluster of hamlets and all those things. Then that's something we. So can maybe at the part. next session or two or whatever. Probably probably th two or th three sessions okay. out. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Ten. Okay. Um, okay on that. <clears throat> yes, we staff will bring something forward in the future to further evaluate that. I would like to redo uh, item C, uh, motion C. Uh, in fact, uh, we did include the uh, by right uses uh, for Matheny, as uh, pointed out by Dave Bryant just now. Uh, so if it's okay with county council, we will undo uh, motion C. So if we could have a motion I to... make that motion to undo C. There, okay. There's several Cs, so... Oh, wait, I'm yeah. sorry, but a motion C... Oh, geez. Uh, all right, sorry. So it's the uh, second C on the slide. I don't know how that happened. Second C on this slide. The one where Matheny was excluded? That Matheny was excluded. Put him back yeah. in. Yeah. So uh, if we could make the motion to undo the motion regarding uh, Section 16 and apply Matheny, uh, Section 16 to Matheny. Uh, I'll make that motion as stated. Undo. Undo and then add Matheny track to it. Can we do that in one motion? Okay. County Council is waived. Yes, we could do that. <clears throat> I'll second. Vote. Dong. Yes. Really? Yes. 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 Willach. Yes. Figliano. Yes. Aguilar. Yes. Mr. Chair, I have one comment. You want a break? No. <laughs> I don't have to go to the bathroom. This is something new. No. Uh, just, just a quick comment. You know, we have uh, all these incorporated cities, and we have all these little islands and these little problems that, that I really see, and Porterville is the worst, uh, where we're making decisions for the city. And... Uh, I, I mean, I I really think that the cities, even though it costs some money, need to look at incorporating these into their cities, annexing, uh, because uh, it puts us at a bad position. Sometimes our rules are different than what the the city's rules are, and they should take a harder look at uh, annexing whenever possible. That's it. Pretty simple. Thank you. We're going to take a short break and then we'll continue oh, with the area. <laughs> no, I don't. Oh. I'm young. I'm <laughs> oh, thanks. Okay, let's get back to our okay. task at hand and finish this off with early mark. Thanks. I needed that. Before you start, just let me give the self help lady. Perfect. Just what I needed. Are you ordering in or what's going to happen? <laughs> well, I said I needed a spot of sugar. <laughs> so gave me a candy bar. I was failing fast. Okay, we're going to continue on to item D, Early Mark Community Plan of 2017 update. Chairman <coughs> Aguilar, 
Commissioners, I am Aaron Bach, Chief Planner, Tulare County Resource Management Agency. And at this time, I would really like to thank uh, quite a few staff uh, with helping us get to this, this uh, level. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Michael Washam. Uh, he dedicated a, a lot of his time uh, to reviewing the documents that we presented here to you today. Uh, Hector Guerra for his uh, large scale environmental impact report, the first one of its kind in Tulare County. Uh, kudos to him. I'd uh, especially like to thank uh, Dave Bryant and Susan Simon for helping put the product together for which you see today. And Jessica Willis for all her additional analysis, especially regarding uh, air quality and GHG, which is going to help uh, quite a few projects hopefully move forward in the community of Burley Mart. Again, uh, Abigail Solis is here today. Uh, she also represents the uh, school board for Early March, and as well as the owner and developer, uh, Greg Davis, for the Eden Produce Company project. So they are available to uh, answer questions as well. Uh, I just want to state at this point, as a matter of disclaimer, this was funded by the state of California uh, for the Housing and Community Development Department Community Development Block Grant. Um, <clears throat> and this is the Early March Community Plan GPA 17-005, inclusive of the uh, Eden Produce Company Project, GPA 14-005, and the Delano Joint High School District Project, GPA 16-003, and the accompanying zone changes for 17-033 through 17-035 for mixed-use overlay combining zone, by right, and zoning district overlay, distri uh, overlay district ordinance map. Okay, I'll, I'll carry on here. Um, the uh, project summary, uh, by way of background, uh, the Board of Supervisors adopted the first community plan on November 29, 1988, by resolution number 88-01-1438 for plus or minus 1,300 acres. Uh, Two, the Board of Supervisors adopted general plan initiation on January 28, 2014, so roughly three years ago. Resolution number 2014-0066 to initiate the general plan amendment. Uh, there's been outreach over the last three years uh, with 15 formal meetings in the community of Early Mart and at the Delano Unified High School District. Uh, the plan includes the community plan and EIR for the northern boundary at Deer Creek. Um, this is this area you can see on this map, and that's uh, Greg Davis's project area. Um, it includes uh, 361 acres of 541 acres that's being expanded in the urban development boundary. The Delano Unified High School District project uh, across the street from the Dillon subdivision, if you remember that, uh, Washington Avenue um, <coughs> in, uh, in Early Mart. Uh, we've also included complete streets, uh, which we were just informed that we are in the running for 1.9 million, uh, which is approved for the State Street and Washington Avenue. And Overall, there are 241 parcels that have, we have rezoned in the early March community. Uh, so as far as workshops and outreach, we did 15 formal meetings. Uh, meetings started in February of 2014 for Complete Streets and Active Transportation Programming. Uh, we had an initial scoping meeting at RMA and to include the Eden Produce Project, and that included, occurred in later 2014, and we had several scoping meetings at the town council in early 2015. Uh, we had the first large-scale meeting, uh, roughly 40 persons, uh, which was sponsored by Self-Help Enterprises and ourselves, November 4th, 2015. Uh, Safe Routes to School meeting on March 30th, 2016. Uh, we had meetings. Uh, Hector and myself went down to the Delano Unified High School District, and those occurred in late 2015. 
And the picture you see here is the meeting with the community we had for the release of the environmental impact reports documents and the community plan on August 3rd, 2017, where it was reported that there was plus or minus 200 people who attended. And uh, we thank Abigail for helping pull that together. Uh, and we met with the town council on September 5th and met with the school board on September 26th, where we requested endorsement for this project to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, some of the constraints that are we found uh, through the studies were uh, there was obviously limited infrastructure available. Uh, we, we hear about that every day from project proponents. Uh, there are zoning and use permit requirements that sometimes, you know, $3,000 or $5,000 will uh, stop a developer from pushing a project forward. Uh, there has been a... a uh, again, I was talking about demographics before, about the uh, Department of Finance numbers and their accuracy. They show growth, um, but there's recent numbers from the school board that shows a loss of population. Uh, so it's not uh, certified uh, demographics, but it is uh, information we can use. Um, there is uh, insufficient available zone land for development, and that's a constant constant complaint because developers don't necessarily develop where you want them to develop. They develop where they own land. So there is, like I was saying, the, the scale and the size of the parcels that are remaining for those developers are not necessarily large enough. So some of our strategies for economic development are to increase the grants potential and development to pay for infrastructure through adoption of this updated community plan, to reduce regulatory hurdles with mixed-use overlay zoning uh, and a reduction in use permit requirements, and having CEQA completed so they can tear off any CEQA documents in the future for their projects, increase services and development to stop population loss and increase potential for growth, and uh, fourth, allow for new available accessible land to stimulate development interest. Of all the communities uh, I've done workshops at, uh, I would say Early Mart, because of its proximity to Delano and because that it does take quite a bit of time to commute to Delano or to Pixley to shop, could obviously stand to provide its own services. And if it was capable of doing that, it could be a very self-sufficient community. But as it stands, there is inadequate infrastructure and people are commuting quite some distance to work and shop. So uh, to do so requires a general plan amendment uh, that includes uh, components A, the planning framework, transportation, circulation, and land use in uh, part one of the general plan. And the general plan amendment incorporates the following, uh, that the county's general plan land use designations. Um, honestly, there hasn't been that much change in the land use designations themselves. Uh, the majority of the properties are still uh, designated residential. Uh, you'll see zoning's quite a bit different, but for the most part, early March has been established as a, a bedroom community for the most part. If you look at the... Uh, percentage of uh, residential compared to commercial. Um, so we did increase some. Obviously, we're expanding the urban development boundary. But because of existing Williamson Act contracts and or agri for agricultural purposes, a large majority of that 541-acre urban development boundary will stay a residential reserve at this time, so about 200 acres or so, or over 200 acres, almost 300 acres. So the zoning and the entitlements that go along with this project are to the create the mixed-use overlay zone in Early Mart uh, under Section 18.9, reduce use permit requirements under Section 16, and rezone uh, approximately 241 parcels in the community plan rezoning. I did want to draw your attention to some of the more vital statistics as far as the rezones themselves. Uh, if you look at the actual acreage of uh, agricultural zone land, uh, it goes from approximately 625 acres, uh, that's 44% under the existing zoning, to actually an increase to almost 794 acres that's going to remain uh, and increase the zoning within the urban development boundary. 
it goes from 44% to 40%. So there, you, you lose some, but you, you get some back within the urban development boundary. Um, the commercial zoning is just increased about 1% to 2% under this plan. Again, like I said, we have an interested developer here, but a lot of those remaining lands that were yellow in the previous graphic because the land use designations are residential when you actually go to the zoning uh, there isn't development interest so those will remain agriculture so there's about one percent increase in commercial uh, zoning in the community and uh, residential remains fairly consistent uh, with the slight increase but for the most part the real advantage is the mixed use overlay that we can go either way in a lot of instances, whether the developer wants to go residential or stay residential, they could add a commercial component. So we're not really locked in a time or place where at this point we're making a decision for these people. They'll have flexibility in the future uh, and that'll kind of indicate what direction Early Mart wants to go in. So the environmental analysis was a full EIR. Um, and uh, we did receive three uh, letters, uh, one by Caltrans, one by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and one by the Air District. Um, as far as uh, traffic, we did a full TIA, TIS analysis, uh, and in no instance, even in the 2040 projection with all of our projects in all of our rezoned areas, they did not f trip any threshold, so we didn't have to do any mitigations at this time. Caltrans requested or suggested that we do uh, improvements uh, at the two intersections along SR-99, and again, our traffic study didn't indicate that that was required, so we, we told them so. And they also asked for uh, setback requirements, and I'm glad Neil Zerling's not here anymore, but the uh, we have asked, asked, for projects to still recognize the setbacks uh, that's going to be required if SR-99 was to expand to the full eight-lane uh, development as prescribed by their concept plan. So we do recognize it, but it would be really hard to put into our project right now when our traffic analysis doesn't say it's necessary, nor does their concept plan um, <laughs> require that, but uh, we, we do ask. Um, as far as uh, biology, uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife asked us to clarify and amplify some mitigation measures. Uh, we didn't see any real harm uh, to any future projects. They were going to have to do protocol level surveys for the most part anyway, or, or at least surveys for development projects. So it's just uh, clarifying what was going to be included in those mitigation measures. So we, we added those to our final EIR. And then the Air District, uh, thanks to the great work of Jessica Willis and Hector Guerra, did not have any, it was a no comment email from them. So we were very, very pleased, pleased with the responses. How'd that happen? <laughs> we do great work. Okay. <laughs> <Emails> later. <laughs> so. I think just for, uh, to, to respond to that, uh, it was just a reminder to them that we really have one project that is a possibility and that was the high score. The rest of it, it's, it's, it's a paper project, if you will. And we won't know with any certainty what may occur over time. So the modeling demonstrated that. And later on, Aaron will point out the statement of override consideration for the air quality resource, but that's being consistent with the general plans EIR. So for this particular project, uh, it, it just didn't trip any thresholds. Well, but I also asked them if they could put that in writing for us. That was the coup, if you will. Normally they'll say, yeah, we have nothing to say. I said, no, no, no. Tell me you have nothing to say in writing and enter it into the record. And uh, Hector's point about the uh, statement of overriding consideration, uh, as far as air quality, again, the immediate projects don't trip any air quality thresholds, but we took a very conservative approach looking at the long-term air quality and greenhouse gas emissions, so we did suggest a statement of overriding consideration for future air, air quality in the cumulative. So the high school project, the Eden project, and the community plan itself cumulatively may, may trip that threshold in the future. So a conservative approach was to do a statement of overriding consideration. 
And that completes staff's report. If the Planning Commission has any questions for us, we're all here and available to answer them. Being none, then let's open the public hearing portion of it. And if there's anybody who would like to comment, <coughs> please state your name and address for the record. My name is Greg Davis. I'm president of Eden Produce Company. Um, my address is 1807 Mystic Meadows, Bakersfield, California. I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, as Aaron mentioned, it's, we've been working on this a long time. I know that our company uh, withdrew our, um, not, we non-renewed the Williamson Act on this about 12, 13 years ago in anticipation of this. It's been a long time to comply with all the requirements I just can't believe it took this long. Um, but there is a great need for uh, housing diversity in Erdy Mart. Um, as Abigail mentioned, the census is eight or 9,000, but there's 13 or 14,000 people living there, and it's overcrowded. Uh, vacancies are impossible to find. People are leaving the community for other communities who have planned for housing uh, diversity in other areas. and so. Some of them are outside Tulare County. We've been farming in Tulare County for about 40 years, um, and we see this as the obvious solution. We have a planet we call Earth. It has 196 million square miles of surface area. 70% of it, 71% of it's underwater. It leaves us with about 57 million square miles. When you take out the 30% uninhabitable mountains and deserts, we're left with 40 million square miles of surface area on which live 7,455,000,000 humans, all of whom enjoy the procreative process, more or less, and we're adding 83 million humans to planet Earth every year. That's about 1.6 million a week. We have to plan for them, and uh, I appreciate your service in doing that. Um, I appreciate all the help that staff has done to put this together. It's very much needed, and uh, look forward to your uh, thoughtful questions and approval of these projects. Thank you very much. Oh. Abigail Solis, 753 Sorry. East Quail Avenue, Early Mart. The slides with the, the slide with the, at the last community meeting. Here, this one. So I just want to quickly talk um, on behalf of Early Mart and in support for this um, update to the plan. Um, the Early March School District um, sent a letter of support for this plan, um, and I am the school board president for Early March School District. If you see here um, at the last Early March community meeting, over 200 people showed up. And I think the reason that that happened, um, and it's happened before, is I told people that we would talk about growth in early March. We talk about the possibility for future housing and, and changes that will happen in the community. The key word there is housing. When you tell a resident of early March that you are going to talk about housing, they will show up. Half of the people there told me that they thought we were going to, to tell them how they could ab get approved for a loan and get in line to, you know, to buy a house. So they were a little upset to hear that there are still some hurdles that we have to go through and jump over and that there are still some problems with um, in expanding our, our sewer capacity in town. So of course we had to review all of that information. However, they were appreciative of these efforts that we've, that we've taken. Um, they are, most of them know what's going on with the situation and want to support um, the expansion of our infrastructure so that we can meet the needs of the community. Recently, the school district learned that between the months of February and March, we lost a substantial number of resident, of students. Our ADA went down almost 100 in, in like a month, which was very um, unusual for, for early March. So that was very um, striking to me as the president. So I asked staff to call each of these families that moved out of the district and asked them why they had done so. What we learned is that they moved out for multiple different reasons. Some of them with the current administration, the way um, it is now, decided that because of their documented status or undocumented status, to just go ahead and move back to Mexico before they got deported. 
um, some of them decided that they were just tired of living in the same home with other people and, and wanted to have a place of their own. And because there isn't a place to, a new place to live in early Mart, moved to neighboring communities. So we saw that people moved to Delano, to Larry, McFarland, so just different, different areas around town. So the, that, this tells us that these people want to b find the place to live. It's just not available to them in early Mart. So um, I'm excited about the possibility of building these new homes as well as any time we talk about growth for Early Mart because I also know people that moved out of Early Mart in the last couple of years that are waiting for the opportunity to move back. <clears throat> They're waiting for an opportunity to purchase a home in the community that they grew up in. So I know that if we build an Early Mart, we will be successful, and I encourage, the, um, I encourage you to move forward with the adoption of, of the of the plan, I don't, sorry, I can't see the way it reads, but um, I encourage your support as, as this early March school district has done. Thank you. Anyone else? No? There's only one other person out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, at this time we will close the public uh, comment period and we will look to staff to help us the rest of the way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, um, I will uh, read these motions. Uh, so the first motion is that the Planning Commission recommend to the Board of S Supervisors certification of the FEIR and the adoption of the uh, adoption of California Environmental Quality Act findings of fact, statement of overriding considerations, and the mitigation monitoring and reporting program, MMRP, for the Early Mark Community Plan 2017 <coughs> update. So moved. Uh, Second. Moved. Dong? Yes. Bailey? Yes. 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 Willach? Yes. Tigriano? Yes. Aguila? Yes. <coughs> Recommend adoption of the general plan amendment for the Early Mark Community Plan 2017 update, GPA 17-005, inclusive of the Eden Produce Company project and the Delano Joint High School District project. So moved. I'll second. Vote. Oh. Dong? <coughs> yes. Bailey? Yes. Yes? Yes. Willach? Yes. Tigliano? Yes. Aguila? Yes. Recommend amending section 18.9 of ordinance number 352 to establish a mixed use overlay combining zone within the early mark UDB. I'll make it uh, that motion as stated. <coughs> Second. Vote. Dong? Yes. Bailey? Yes. 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 Willach? Yes. Tigliano? Yes. Aguila? Yes. Recommend amending section 16 of ordinance number 352 to allow additional buy right uses within the early Mart UDB. So moved. Second. Vote. Dong? Yes. Bailey? Yes. Yes? Yes. Willach? Yes. Petigliano? Yes. Aguila? Yes. <coughs> Recommend amending ordinance number 352 as set forth in the zoning district ordinance map consistent with the early Mart community plan 2017 update. So moved. I'll second it. Vote. Long? Yes. Bailey? Yes. 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 Willach? Yes. Petigliano? Yes. Aguila? Yes. Thank you you for the time you put into it. Thank you. I would just li like to add that uh, growing up in early Mart, probably, I'm going to say Mr. Davis says it's been a long time. It's longer than you think. <coughs> Back in, uh, I'm going to say about 45 years ago, there was a giant sign in this property that uh, on 56 that said, shopping center coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> That's eternal optimism. <laughs> By the way, uh, I'd just like to, if time permitting, volunteer when you start working on the zone change to be involved in some of those conversations. Uh, you know, Wayne and I are involved in commercial real estate and we attend a lot of uh, interesting uh, seminars about growth trends 
and some of the trends I've seen are dealing with large malls like Sequoia Mall. Things are not going to happen anymore. Smaller um, <coughs> strip centers will have to be anchored by uh, a market. And that basically used to be 50% of the retail wherever it was in, in commercial developments were clothing. And that's gone to like 25%. So um, I have a lot of these things prepared by national companies for people like myself. Uh, so that we develop land we can figure out the proper mix. But we, we're going to have to reconsider on some older, of course, Tulare County doesn't have huge malls, what uh, other kind of uses uh, that we should have by right, including residential, residential communities mixed in with, uh, it's an old concept. I mean, you used to live above where you work, and that's, <coughs> that's the future of all retail will be combined in a higher density. Well, we, we appreciate that, and that's the whole concept behind the mixed-use overlay. And we will let this Planning Commission know when all our future workshops are. So you can attend and help us prescribe zoning uh, I have in these communities. I on that that will help you <laughs> studies that have recently done. Yes, the uh, RMA tries to be as progressive as possible. We are. We're not trying. You are. We are. We are as progressive as possible. Hey, we'll continue with the director's report. <laughs> yeah, there's not much time, so. Okay, uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate everybody's time and effort in this. <coughs> I really like to come in uh, and, and expound on, on the <coughs> about the staff, the staff's time they put in. Uh, Jessica and Susan, many, many late nights, late, late nights. In fact, one around the clock time when she was still here when we came in in the morning. Uh, to get this stuff done, so so I really appreciate the staff. Uh, we're gonna. This is just the beginning. I mean, we're bringing in 11 hamlet plans and another five community plans associated with the same grant, as well as some larger communities. We're working with, uh, on Goshen, which will be coming later, but we're just starting the Goshen uh, plan, as well as uh, Three Rivers will go out in the next month or so for the environmental uh, draft environmental impact report. Will go out. In the fall. So you're just, we're just at the beginning of this train of community plan updates, all geared towards uh, uh, improving the economic development <coughs> area for, for the county, making those things more, more by right. Uh, each of these, the, the, the two uh, zone changes that you have here, other than the individual properties, the 18.9 uh, mixed use and the 16, uh, section 16, more additional by right uses, each time we've updated a community plan, that's when we're adding that community to those mixed use rights and, and to those additional by right uses. So we are, we're just building. The first one we did was Traver a couple, two, two and a half years ago, and then uh, and Pixley and Strathmore and Terrabella, Ducor, all of those, and now, and now Early Mart, as well as the legacy plans, as well as the hand, they're all building on that soon. All of the uh, county within development boundaries will have that mixed use overlay as, as we build this out. So that's what we're here to work. So that is the future, especially for some of these smaller legacy uh, communities. The type of live and ha above your house or live on the premises that works out well because those are the those are the opportunities for some of those very small things because it's going to be a limited basis of, of maybe some uses like that uh, for 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 those areas. So. Uh, <clears throat> With that said, I know we only have one meeting scheduled in November. Mm. We have uh, the next meeting, or the second, not the next meeting, the, the last meeting in October will be for the uh, Animal Confined Facilities Plan, and we are pretty much, with the exception of maybe some parcel maps, we're not going to want to have any other public hearings during that one, kind of set that aside for that. So that's going to take up the second uh, October meeting for sure. I'm, I'm kind of just kind of putting it out there now that potentially if the board or if the commission would be open to potentially holding an additional meeting between n November and mid-December if, if needed. And we'll talk about it more later because we have so many of these plans we want to get done and, and, and for the board <coughs> before the end of the year that we're kind of limited on the dates that we're having, especially when we're wiping out that one specifically for the uh, facility plan. So, so just something to think about uh, potentially. And, and I think at the next meeting, or certainly by the time we're coming with the confined facilities, 
at that point, we'll, we'll be knowing whether we really need to try to have another meeting to, to add that in, so. That, that would be November 15th. <coughs> What's the October and when's 11th Thanksgiving? meeting? Thanksgiving? Oh, so it's not that week. It'll be the week okay. before. It'd be the okay. October 11th, the big meeting, or not? Uh, no, no, the October 20. Um, the the 11th won't won't be that. We have a few parcel maps and maybe a use permit. But the uh, the one the 26th is. I the won't be here on the 11th. 25th. Delma. Yeah. 25th will be the the confining facilities plan. You know, we we have. I'm not just saying this to make you feel good, but it's true. We have an amazing county staff that includes RMA County Council that supports us and helps us to make I think good decisions and so uh, thank you very much and that Susan Simon I've dealt with her you call her she 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 get you know she answers pleasantly no matter whether I should have seen it or not she she doesn't rub it in like Aaron does but uh, <laughs> But I like it, Aaron. I mean, okay, uh, good. He did it with a smile. It makes him feel good. Yeah, it makes him feel good. He's overeducated. <laughs> so, that's fine. Yeah, he's overeducated. But anyway, th thank you very much for uh, your hard work because it's great. County Council, all well, ever since says anything, he just grunts. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. Updates. Uh, yes, yeah, in terms of the vote update, uh, I know we're doing our, our we're doing a push here. <coughs> No, it opened and I got credit for it. I had two phone calls for, from farmers that called and said, wow, you are really powerful. We just told you that. And I went, I didn't so, even know something. So I went, oh, yeah. The issue we found out was that they were having uh, issues with the well. That's why it was closed. Oh, oh. To, uh, make those well, great. So, yeah. so it's open. And I believe I Street, I passed that along mm -hmm. to our, our maintenance team. And uh, we'll be evaluating that road maybe for a future uh, more exercise. <coughs> Did you have any uh, road work for the purifier? Uh, no, actually, we are, I think our, our roads were, were Can't burn the road up, huh? <laughs> well, you can. You can. can. Uh, oftentimes, uh, <coughs> the, the firefighting equipment and apparatus does damage on the roads as well. So, but, but I think we, we, we sustained it fairly well. One person who really knows how powerful Nancy is is Charlie. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Any uh, planning commission items? Yeah, yeah, I would like to bring in one life-changing uh, event. <laughs> and uh, every morning, Bill would come up to me and, and uh, greet me in the morning at, at the planning commission and call, calling me his enemy. That's right. I are. And, the re and the reason for that is because I convert part of his profit that he makes into my salary <laughs> now effective at the end of this month he would no longer have to call me my because i'd be retiring from the treasury department two two, two retirement incomes good move and, and plus i told you i would retire before you guys fix 416 <laughs> <laughs> that's true well if there's nothing else then we will adjourn thank you toga party toga Oh, God. <clears throat> Good job, Mr. Gill. Long way.